Uh, okay, uh, we're going to get started. My name is Josh Rank, and I'm the content marketing specialist here at AutoRabbit. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to be discussing some ways uh, to maintain data security within your Salesforce DevOps pipeline. If you have any questions, please submit them to the Q&A section below, and we'll take some time at the end uh, to go through those. We are first going to hear uh, from Jacob. He's the DevOps specialist here at AutoRabbit followed by Abhi and Pranav, who are both customer success managers at Demand Blue. So I'll go ahead and kick it over to Jacob to begin the discussion. Awesome, thank you, Josh. So just a quick introduction of who AutoRabbit is before we get started. So we are a complete DevSecOps platform for Salesforce. And what we provide is a single pane of glass for you to view your entire DevOps pipeline. So that includes things such as backup and recovery, archiving things out of your system, data seeding new environments into the release management pipeline and automating as much of that process as possible while also maintaining the security there, as well as maintaining code security and quality via our static code analysis offering. And I will pass things off to, to me, or Team Demand Blue to chat about themselves. Oh, thank you, Jacob. Go on to the next slide. Thanks, Jacob, for you know talking briefly about the Auto Rabbit release management process and what it does. And also, thank you, Josh, for that wonderful introduction. Now, let's talk a little bit about continuous management engagement. I'm sorry, and how Demand Blue helps facilitate it. In order to understand the importance of an on-demand model. What we have to look at is both, uh, you know, how value and time kind of progress through the engagement, right? So if you see on this graph, the curve for both value and time, if value goes up and through time, you know, it will eventually come down because of lack of engagement, right? So in traditional service models over time, like I said, the value provided decreases once the vendor disengages. Demand Blue provides an on-demand service for Salesforce. So what that means is we provide an ongoing value through continuous engagement for all Salesforce support at a lower cost, where depending on the use case is provided and the needs and requirements of our clients are captured on an ongoing basis. The momentum never stops in this service model. We also discuss solutions with our clients that might be good to have now, but it can also become priority in the long run and provide recommendations and best practices that keep our clients informed at all times so that they can take the right decision at the right time. All these details help build a roadmap where information is available as and when our clients need and want it. We help them with actionable and tangible solutions, which they can start using immediately. Over to you, Pranav. Thanks, Abhi, for the insight on the continuous engagement and the way we've practiced with our customers. Now let's talk about the three main components of our services. Being affordable, which means pay as you use, allows customers to pay only for the skills and services that we used for the contract period. Being flexible means to consume as much as you want or as little as you need. There's no fixed price to it. Being scalable, which means based on the business needs, resources can be added or removed during any phase of the project execution. And lastly, our audio services are available 24-7. Now let's talk about the six ways to keep our DevOps pipeline secure. Keeping your eye on the ball, institute trick and data backups, automate when possible and reduce errors, test, audit, and monitor your Salesforce environment, ensure proper Salesforce implementation, and lastly, communicate the best practices. Let's start by keeping our eye on the ball. Next slide, please. Thank you. What is DevOps? DevOps is a collaboration between the development and the operations team. Therefore, breaking down silos in an effort to minimize the effort and risk involved when releasing the software. What you see here is a basic representation of the software development life cycle. In the wider software world, there are hundreds of tools that can help facilitate and automate processes at a different stage. Salesforce DevOps is no different from the broader definition of the word but it is specifically centered around ensuring admins and developers can deploy changes and work through the software development life cycle in the most efficient way. 
possible and with the minimal bugs and disruptions to the users. In a nutshell, DevOps is an outgrowth of Agile. It allows the operations team to provide constant feedback to the development team around the code, hence allowing efficient impact analysis with regards to the end users and quick troubleshooting thereof to maximize efficiencies. I will now pass on to Abhi for the next slide. Thanks, Pranav. Uh, that was a wonderful insight on what DevOps is. Now, as Pranav just shared information about, you know, the in and outs of DevOps, I will dive into how we can gain DevOps success, right? So we recommend you keep your eye on the ball with the three E's to transform your vision into reality. And these three E's are engage, execute, and empower. Now let's talk a little bit about how Demand Blue uses these three pillars to kind of communicate with our clients. So let's talk about engage first, the first E. Engage is all about understanding our clients, right? And connecting with them and helping them innovate. How do we do this, you ask? The importance of continuous engagement cannot be stressed enough. So, you know, at Demand Blue, we engage our clients on a regular basis. We engage with our clients on a regular, regular basis by having strategy, strategy talks with them. You know, their business is changing. So is the world around them, right? So, you know, keeping them engaged, keeping them informed, you know, helps them. Also consulting them on haves and good to haves and discussing different areas of their business and the various pain points they might have. Also any opportunities that, that might result from or that might come out of these discussions can also help them turn um, their products into assets and profits. And also discuss with them how Salesforce best fits their needs and their overall and their overall ecosystem. How do we do this? So at Demand Blue, we have our customer portal. Our Demand Blue customer portal serves as the orchestration point, right? So here, our customers and internal users have a 360 degree view of all the projects and initiatives. Requirements are captured both here in our portal and in Jira, and also initiatives and projects are approved by the clients. Um, the, second, the second way we do or engage our clients is through our JIRA project management tool, right? So all the epics and user stories are created in JIRA. Teams and developers are assigned to the particular projects and initiatives. Our clients are provided JIRA licenses to start collaborating with us by reviewing and creating user stories and sharing information and documentation across. Now let's talk about the second E, which is execute. After understanding and forming a connection with the client, in the, engage, in the engagement phase, the next step is about analyzing and executing a project, building a roadmap, and helping our clients adopt best practices. How do we do this? Our core team of CSMs, solution architects, developers, and subject matter experts plan a project, design a solution, and also create the initiative, along with building a better roadmap for our clients. Subsequently, we build and deploy the solution and provide required training to the users so that they can use the application as and when they want. At this stage, we get ready to deploy our work, right? And we work with various DevOps tools in this stage to achieve the desired results. Now let's talk about the last E, which is empower. After executing the project, it is now time to empower our clients. We provide various metrics such as KPIs, the key performance indicators, to both our clients and internal teams so that they can track the progress, measure the success, and move forward. Through our customer portal, our clients can see different metrics related to updates on projects or history of any given tasks completed, the KPIs, action items to be taken up, and also status reports. Over to the next slide. And Jacob will continue with the benefits of better code. Thank you, Abhi and Pranav, for talking about the view, the vision of DevOps and ways that you and like we can help to enable from a process perspective, just the overall keeping your eye on and keeping your focus. And one of the tactical ways that you can do that as an organization is focusing on the improvement of your code, whether that be in the code that you're pushing through your pipeline or the existing code that's in your production instance. 
And when we look at improving our overall code, what we see from our customers using uh, code, scan, code scan for static code analysis is that they're able to get ahead of vulnerabilities before releasing bad code, which ultimately reduces rework and protects their organization. And when we look at some of the implications of bad code, bad code is going to account for 7% of your data loss and corruption in your Salesforce instance. It's also going to create unwanted changes that are inherently difficult to fix because they're hard to find. And when you start to improve your code in your system, you're going to be able to lessen your risk of security vulnerabilities and have more successful deployments because there's less conflict of bad code in your system. And overall, by improving your code, you're going to enable better functionality, which is going to create a better user experience. So whether you're using a static code analysis tool or some other internal process for code review, better code is always going to yield better apps and a more stable production environment. And when we look at the vision of code stability, if you're looking to have an immediate impact, static code analyzers are the most reliable way to achieve code stability. But no matter how you get there, there are a few universal truths about what cleaner code will bring to your org. So the first is the ability to have full visibility into the code that's in your production instance, but also in the code that you're pushing through your pipeline. When you're able to reduce your technical debt, you're actually gonna be able to streamline your development processes and have less failures and failed merges. When you're able to find and fix bugs and errors as they occur, you're able to improve the speed in which your pipeline delivers at. There's constantly a debate that when you have fast releases into your system, they're going to come at the expense of quality. But when you strive for a universal goal of code stability, these two goals can work in harmony to reach your production instance. And if you choose to address code quality issues through automation, what you're able to expect is a higher level of code visibility throughout your organization. You're going to be able to reduce the technical debt, including the code that you're pushing into your production, as well as the technical debt that you've amassed while having a Salesforce instance. You're going to be able to increase the feature velocity and productivity releases that you have. And overall, you're going to be able to increase the security of your application. Uh, anything to add from the demand blue side? I think absolutely, that's rightly said, bad code results in bad deliveries, of course. Thank you for letting us know on the importance of having this code analysis done. Next slide, please. Now let's move on to the importance of data backups. Over to you, Jacob. Thank you, Pranav. And when we speak with our customers and their inceptions of their data disaster recovery plans, the mindset has really switched from a if a data loss event occurs to when a data loss event occurs. And that's not surprising. 96% of businesses experience an outage over the course of three years. And losing access to your system is going to disrupt your organization, negatively impact your customer, and take valuable team members' time away from their daily tasks in order to restore what was lost. And there are some essential steps you can take to mitigate these risks, but the truth is threats are constantly evolving. What you need is to have plans in place to prevent data loss events in tandem with an emergency plan for restoring operations should you lose access to your data. And when we look at the effects of data loss, data loss events are difficult to address because they can come as a result of a variety of causes. And oftentimes, customers and organizations are only aware of a data loss event when it's too late. On average, it takes about 206 days to detect a data breach. And when we start looking at the financial impact of these data loss events, they often come from areas like redundant tasks for your team to go through and fix the issues that they find. The loss of operational ability if a data loss event occurs and depending on the severity, it can also damage your reputation 
and incur regulatory fines. Our customers tell us that the downtime from a data loss event can cost them up to $12,000 per minute. So when we look at a disaster recovery strategy, it can be customized and oftentimes should actually be customized to fit your particular areas of importance. You wanna make sure that your mission critical components of your system are the first ones that are restored to get your business back to normal as quickly as possible. And when you're creating your disaster recovery plan, there's two key metrics you wanna make sure you include. The first is your recovery point objective. So the maximum uh, data period that you're willing to tolerate from the loss of your system. The second is your recovery time objective, which is essentially how fast you can recover from the moment of disaster to the moment you can return to normal operations. And when we think about backups and restores, there are two sides of the same coin. Your backups are only as powerful as your recovery functionality. So in thinking through your recovery strategy, it needs to be automated. You don't wanna have a lot of tedious manual tasks involved. And you need to think about how much time, when we think back to the recovery time objective, how much time you're willing to tolerate the system being down and what your, how your recovery strategy maps to that. So in talking with our customers that utilize our backup and rec uh, recovery solution vault, they point to these five benefits as being the most value additive after employing their backup and recovery solutions. So the first is the ability to instantly recover data, metadata, file attachments, and all the important data that they have in their Salesforce instance. The second is the need to have their backup and recovery solution be scalable as their business changes, it needs to change with it, as well as be cost effective. The third is it needs to meet regulatory compliance needs and match the industries in which you're in. We work heavily within the financial services industry where we see multiple regulations that companies need to adhere to and your backup and recovery plan and solution tools need to match that strategy as well. It needs to quickly restore Salesforce system data and recover functionality. And arguably the most important is it needs to have the power to roll back to a previously steady state. If a developer were to push code into your system that caused you to lose access to your Salesforce, you need to have the ability to take your system back to a known state and time that is completely steady and ready to use to limit the downtime to the business. Anything to add from the demand blue side? No, oh, absolutely. You said it all. Thanks, Jacob, for explaining the importance <laughs> of the data backup and how it can affect us if not addressed. Now let's talk about the automation and how it may help us to reduce the errors. Yeah, absolutely. So automation can mean a tool like AutoRabbit, or it can mean daisy chaining together disparate technologies and internal processes. Every organization is at a different level of DevOps maturity. But as you continue on in that journey, these are the primary improvements you'll see from automation. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first is that wasted time is ultimately going to equal wasted money. The more manual steps, the more time is going to take, and it's ultimately going to elongate your lead time and lead to increased DevOps costs. When we automate processes, we're able to take out the complexity involved a lot of times with these manual processes which is gonna reduce errors in your system. When we're able to automate the quality checks, it's gonna be faster than having a traditional developer look at it, but it's also gonna be more thorough than an eyeball scan. And when we increase automation throughout the pipeline, it's going to increase release velocity, which will lessen your lead time and lead to more value being provided to your business faster. And the truth about developing on Salesforce is it's inherently risky. Because Salesforce was built to be a CRM, not a development platform, you're actually missing key things that you need in order to deliver your apps. So when we look at things like sensitive customer data, you're inherently going to touch it because of the PII that sits inside of your CRM. 
when we look at the Salesforce metadata structures, they're highly structured together and they're actually quite unusual for a high touch development process. Because of this, they're gonna require special handling and skills to address them effectively. When we look at compliance, a failure to meet compliance and regulatory and risk regula reduction requirements, it's gonna create significant exposure, both from an operational perspective for your company, but also from a financial perspective. And when we look at the way that Salesforce is able to connect to multiple different systems, whether that be through managed packages or integrations, these connections often proliferate potential failure points for your company. So when we look through an example of automation in a continuous integration pipeline, this is the simplified way that things can occur via automation. When these steps are automated, when you're able to automatic, like, automate your pre and post deployment steps, you're able to automate your commit validations and your merge validations and only change the things you want to change, not push entire releases, you're able to reduce the ability for human error to occur. Uh, are you guys familiar with this as well as the demand blue side? Yes, certainly. I think CI CD is something that we have been practicing a lot for, and of course, at the same time, bringing in automation on the same platform. So definitely, this is something that we have been practicing, yes. That's quite an insight. That's quite an insight on the automation. Thanks for that, Jacob. Let's talk about the test, audit, and monitor for Salesforce environment. Absolutely. So when we look at the importance of continuous analysis, the truth is that data security is always evolving. And to stay on top of that, leading organizations often look to regulatory bodies like OWASP and their top 10 list that lists out the most prevalent data or data and security risk to an IT organization. So when we look at the OWASP 2021 list, we see things like sensitive data exposure, which we talked about as a risk on Salesforce due to the PII in the system. But what's also a risk to Salesforce is cross-site scripting in the apps you deploy. The ability for hackers to inject code into the websites and applications you build and steal customer data. So because of this, analyzing your current procedures is essential, but also offering improvements and stress testing your environment as well. You have a need for can, or consistent attention to your platform to make sure it's running as correctly as possible. And you also have a requirement to yourselves and to your company to remain updated on the regulatory changes that occur in your industry. So when we look at addressing code quality with automation, the ultimate goal is to fix vulnerabilities before they become a problem in production that could lead to exposure of sensitive data. What you need to do is secure applications during the development process to reduce risk and cost, while at the same time accelerating the pace of deployment. And as we can see, the earlier we can catch bugs, security vulnerabilities, and bad code in the process, the more cost-effective and faster we can ultimately release code as a whole. And when we look at the compliance side of the coin, an, often a misnomer that we see with clients is that they view compliance as something they simply need to adhere to. But the truth is compliance is something that you create and it's a standard you hold your company to. And as such, you wanna make sure you're accommodating for these three metrics. So the first is testing and more importantly, automated testing, which will reduce the likelihood of compliance issues related to bad code or bad processes. You wanna make sure that you have an auditing process in place. And it's not something that you only look at when issues occur, you're checking your audits constantly and you're building up that audit log history to be able to go back even further than when an incident occurred and figure out what work contributed to a breach. And the last is you need to make sure that you're actively monitoring because that will assure that your system and processes are working exactly as designed. 
So whether you're using a DevOps platform or some other internally built process, if you're not accommodating for all three of these variables, you're leaving yourself vulnerable. Anything to add from the demand blue side? No, uh, Jacob, you you said it perfectly. Um, you know, and just um, you know having having a better code and having data backup, automation, kind of continuous integration and analysis, all these definitely help to ensure a proper sales for implementation, on which we are going to talk about next. Yep. So thanks, Jacob, uh, for your wonderful insights. And uh, yeah, having all those different points in place, they definitely help in you know facilitate a proper sales for Salesforce implementation, I'm sorry. Um, connecting the Salesforce orgs and their respective repositories with the DevOps tools during, during the execution phase helps us through the implementation process, right? So these tools help us to move changes from the Dev sandbox to the QA sandbox, then to the UAT or full sandbox, and then finally to production. A few of those DevOps tools we use here in Demand Blue are Bitbucket for version control, Code Scan for static code analysis, and Axel Q for regression testing. These different processes help us to create user stories and commit the metadata changes from the source org. We also have various quality gates set up within the CI CD process for an easier and faster delivery that help us with an efficient and continuous process. These include uh, managing Apex tests, running static code analysis, managing Selenium tests, and also validating changes. And finally, in the end, these different processes and tools make sure that all these changes are safely and efficiently deployed to the target org. Now I will pass it on to Prana for a use case. Thanks, Abhi, for the detailed insight. Let me now walk you through all the use case, which will I talk about the CICD process and the audit habit tool being utilized here. Consider two different developers working on two different sandboxes, also working on the same different user story, wherein there might be a chance that some common components are being developed between these two user stories. This tool helps us creating a pipeline wherein we can have multiple developers sandboxes made available. Using this pipeline, the changes from these developer sandboxes, once merged, are then moved into the partial sandbox, wherein we perform a system testing. It is then moved to the UAT and likewise to production. Please note that depending on each customer, these pipelines may vary. These tools play a vital role in managing the conflict that may arise due to the component development from different sandboxes. Further, it helps maintaining a repository of components that are being developed in either of the sandboxes. We then run a set of quality checks to ensure the optimum code coverage. At the same time, once these are done, we go back to the tool and promote and deploy to the higher environment. Let's now move further, communicating the best practices. Over to you, Jacob. Thank you, Pranav. And when we look at the best practices inside of Salesforce, what we're oftentimes looking at is the infrastructure itself. So there's common goals. You want to innovate quickly. You need to deliver fast. But if you're not securing those releases and making sure that they're at the highest quality, you're ultimately not making progress as an organization. So there's sometimes a perceived conflict between security and usability. If we secure the application so much, it won't match the features the business is looking for. But ultimately through a DevSecOps approach, you're able to ingrain all of those into your processes and deliver safe quality apps at a high release velocity. So some of the ways you can do this is by utilizing tools that your team can thoroughly understand, not only from an operational perspective, but also from a importance perspective and how they contribute to security. You want to make sure you can determine which areas of your system absolutely need to be connected and ultimately renew or remove connections between areas that don't necessitate it. The more input you have into your DevOps pipeline that you don't control, the more risk you're opening yourself up to. And you ultimately want to use a trustworthy and secure dev platform. 
what we've seen from a lot of our customers is that to completely control their DevOps operations on Salesforce, they're opting to put their DevOps pipelines on-prem behind their firewalls so that they control every single aspect in a release pipeline. And while an effective security program often includes passwords and possibly two-factor authentication, passwords can be lost, stolen, or oftentimes access rights can be abused. That's why experts recommend companies monitor access patterns to watch for unusual activity, such as a large spike in user access requests, unusual access locations, and so forth. By putting these access controls in place, you're able to limit the ability of cyber criminals to utilize things such as login screens to access things and ultimately hack into your system. And when we look at defining your employees' best practices for a secure, safe pipeline, we often see things, and this is standard, that strong passwords are essential. And we need to be aware of phishing and malware attempts. But when we dive deeper, 17% of data breaches involved malware and 22% involved phishing. So adherence to your employee best practices will greatly reduce these risks. You also need to be conscious of your user permissions, making sure that only the correct employees have access to the correct permissions. And you ultimately need to utilize things like encryption, pseudonymization, and anonymization as well to completely protect your customer's data. And I'll pass things over back to the Demand Blue team. Thanks, Jacob. Thanks, Jacob, for the insight on that. Now let's talk about the matrices in the slide, which is nothing but the result of implementing DevOps at Demand Blue. What you see here is the time frame within which we are able to deploy from our developer sandbox to the partial and further to the UAT and then to prod. Please note that adhering to these practices have resulted us in two times faster deployment as we don't have to recreate the chain set. Here we are also talking about the quality of deliverables and setting up the processes in place. These tools help it to ensure that we meet the targets and improve on these processes continuously. Hence, there is a constant improvement of 15% on the projects that we build and deliver. I will now request Abhi to go over the rest of the practices for you. Thanks, Pranav. Um, and just adding on to what uh, Pranav said, faster deployments and quality of deliverables help developers through the product development lifecycle, right? So, you know, they don't have to sit and wait for deployments anymore. Uh, developers can spend their time learning and can be available for other initiatives as well. We have noticed that this activity has resulted in a 20% increase in total developers' productivity and also a 25% increase in overall process adherence. Now, yeah, these were the metrics uh, and these are some of the ways we communicate best practices internally and yeah. All right, well, thank you guys very much. That was great. Uh, we're going to move into the Q&A section. So if you have any questions, uh, just add them to the uh, Q&A option down below, and we will uh, answer them. All right, it looks like we've got a couple of them coming in here. Uh, the first one is, how does DevOps benefit organizations? I think it up. Well, that's a good question. Uh, DevOps greatly streamlines the development processes and improves org delivery quality, right? The numbers we mentioned that you see on the slide, right, are nothing but the matrices how demand blue found success with the DevOps. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's see here. There's another one that says, what are the key DevOps KPIs? Well, uh, to talk about the key DevOps KPI, I'll start with deployment frequency. Uh, this is the frequency in which we can deploy, followed by lead time to deploy changes, the lead time that is required for us to deploy, deployment time. Uh, this is nothing but the time taken to deploy the changes, right? Uh, time to restore the services. Uh, in case of defects, you know, usually what happens is, you know, how soon we are able to fix and restore the application. And lastly, what I feel is the code failures and the defect counts, right? These are nothing but the numbers of defects identified. 
All right, great. Thanks a lot. Um, let's see. What are some of the challenges in implementing a DevOps process? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that up. Uh, wonderful question. So I think, or rather we think one of the biggest challenges is the probably the cultural challenge uh, a, a client can face while moving away from their existing process and adopting a new process. Um, so what, what they need to do, what we need to do as a team is, you know, share with our employees the value of DevOps by adopting a DevOps, uh, an efficient DevOps process. The, the organizations should also support by providing a clear vision process, adequate training, and also, I think, uh, a time for the team to be comfor comfortable with the new process. Okay. Um, where do you recommend we start if we don't have a DevOps process? Um, I think, you know, starting by establishing an agile process and uh, how we spoke about in, in the presentation, uh, practicing continuous engagement. I think these two would be good places to start. Okay. Um, why don't we throw it over to Jacob here? Uh, this one says, how DevSecOps will involve DevOps, which I'm guessing means what, how do those two relate to each other? Absolutely. So when we're thinking about adding security into our DevOps procedures, it's not necessarily changing the way you do DevOps today. It's just really baking in the processes involved with making sure that your pipeline is secure and compliant. So adding in things like audit trails to be able to see developer history or adding in tools like static code analysis to improve your testing, not just beyond, hey, is my code going to work? But ultimately, what are the security vulnerabilities that I could potentially be adding into my environment? Okay, well, there's actually kind of a follow up to that. The next question is what kind of security security vulnerabilities can static code analysis prevent? Yeah, that's another great question. So we touched on a few inside of the presentation. So via cross site scripting, for example, but to really get into the weeds on how static code analysis can prevent that. And when we when we look at the types of languages in Salesforce, there's Visual Force, Lightning Web Components, obviously Apex Code, you've got metadata rules. And that's actually something you need to consider when you look at a static code analysis tool is what is the breadth of languages that it's really scanning and considering? Because if we look at a lot of open source static code analysis tools, they're simply looking at your Apex Code, which is great, you need to do that. But if you simply stop there and you don't, for, exa or for example, examine your Visual Force Code that's actually where a cross-site scripting error can occur. A hacker can interject code into your site and steal or your customer's data or create fake credentials and actually log into your system and create profiles and modify data as well. All right, well, thank you very much. That was great. Um, I think that's a great place to end it. Um, so I wanna thank you guys for taking the time to uh, share your expertise with, expertise with us. And also thank you to everyone uh, that uh, joined us today, um, asked some questions. Um, feel free to reach out if uh, you have any follow-ups and have a great day.